wonderful introduction. So, um, several weeks ago, I was spending some time on a Sunday afternoon with my mother. She's 88 years old, and she has dementia, and she has Alzheimer's. And we had to place her in a nursing home in March when she fell and broke her hip. And anyway, <clears throat> so most days now she has difficulty recognizing me or my siblings. And um, But we usually try to talk about things from her past because that's typically all she can remember and talk with us about. So um, on this Sunday a couple of weeks ago, I said, Mom, I was asked to give a presentation to this group today. And I really don't know how, what to talk about. I said, you know, I, they want me to talk about my career. I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just, I don't have anything exciting that's happened to me. And um, she just kind of grinned at me and kept eating her lunch. And then all of a sudden, a moment of total clarity, she said to me, Chris, well, she said Chrissy. She still calls me Chrissy. <laughs> she said, you have to go back into your memory and talk about things that were important in your career even if you didn't realize they were important at the time. And I thought, wow, you know, I, that's, that's a great approach. I, suddenly I kind of had these ideas. So I, she had her lunch in front of her and a placement. I ripped it off and I started writing down notes. And uh, so here we are today. Um, people are really surprised oftentimes when I tell them that uh, when I finished high school, um, there was no pr prospect of college for me. I never studied. I was a very disengaged student, to say the least, and I thought I needed, I had everything I needed to get on with my life. Um, so just before graduation, one of my teachers at my high school helped me find a job uh, as a clerk typist in a purchasing de department. And my only quantifiable skill was that I could type 90 words a minute. And um, so my job was to type purchase orders, and I was so happy I was going to make $4.03 an hour. <laughs> so I jumped in head first, and within a few weeks, I was looking for more work to do. And um, I'll never forget the day the department director came down to my department and wanted to meet the person who was asking for more work. I'll never forget that. But my job became a lot more interesting, and um, I got to do other things instead of just typing all day. Um, so it was, a, it was about that time that I started to notice the way leaders did their work and I thought I wanted to be challenged and I want to make a difference. So with the help of a tuition assistance program at work, I was able to start taking classes at night at Macomb Community College. And my poor study habits came back to haunt me because of how much I missed in high school. And it was hard for me to work all day and go to school at night. Um, because of being a poor student, but it was then that I decided to set some goals for myself. And I said, you know what? I'm going to set some short-term goals. My first one is to finish this semester. So I did. And then the next one was to take more classes, and eventually I said, I'm going to get my associate's degree. And so on it went. And almost, um, I don't know, 11, 12 years later, I finished my MBA at the University of Detroit, all going to school at night and working full-time. And at that point in time, I didn't realize that those goals that I set early on were the first of many that I'd make over the next 40 years, just small goals one step at a time. For me, it made it easier to try to achieve what I wanted to achieve. So while I was working and attending school at night, I was promoted my first real secretarial position. And I have to tell you, my new boss was very intimidated, demanding, and he smoked a cigar in the office. <laughs> He also had a really bad temper. For example, if I typed a letter, he would hold it up to the light, and if he could see correction fluid, for those of you who remember that, it would come out of his office crumbled up in a ball, or if he was in a good mood, it would come out as a paper airplane. <laughs> Sometimes he would get so angry after a difficult conversation or a meeting, he would literally throw his phone. And if any of you remember the princess phones? <laughs> we would throw the phone, and I would just kind of chuckle and wait for that receiver to come recoiling back across the room. Uh, it, it, was, it was tough to work for him. But um, as you might have guessed, for me to tolerate that kind of behavior, the salary was very good. I made great money for a secretary in those days, and it helped me pay for my college. And um, so I learned how to deal with his anger 
I set my limits as to what I was going to tolerate, and I just worked through it. So, and my team is, I'm telling them all these things, so, because um, you got to laugh at this next one. So, one of my duties was to get his lunch every day. <clears throat> and what I didn't realize, that my biggest challenge was to win over the people in the kitchen. You see, they didn't like it when I called at noon every day to uh, ask them to make lunch for the boss, even though he did sign their paychecks every week. And after a few days of calling, and no one would answer the phone, or when they did answer, they would just put it down, and I could hear him talking in the background. So, <laughs> you know who was calling to order lunch again, and she didn't really think we're going to deliver it. And I learned quickly, if I was going to get somebody to help me make his lunch, I had to go down to the kitchen, I had to figure out what's going on. So when I got to the kitchen, I didn't know what I was going to expect. I thought maybe it would be a, you know, a conflict or something, but what I met were two of the nicest people that actually became my friends, Johnny and Bessie. And I got to know them, their families, I got to know everybody in the kitchen. And as much as I disliked the idea of fetching his lunch every day, they became my friends and it made that task much more tolerable. Um, in fact, when Johnny retired, I went back to his retirement party, even though I no longer worked, um, worked there. But really, at that point, a light kind of went on for me, and I started to use that same approach. It sounds simple, but I was 19, 20 years old. Use that same approach in other aspects of my, my uh, professional life, and that was you get a lot more done by going over and meeting somebody and talking to them. And if you have a difficult situation on the job where there's a conflict, get out of your office, go over and talk to them face to face. Don't send an email. Go and greet the person and try to figure out how to resolve that conflict. And um, I used that when I was working with the other secretaries. You know, they would protect their boss's calendars, and the only way you can get something done is to start, how is your family? How was your weekend? And then you kind of get through all that, so it really helped me out. And I also, after the experience working there, I decided that if I was ever in charge, I would treat everyone with the same respect that I expected in return. So shortly before I graduated from Walsh College, one of my college professors told me about a job at Beaumont in Troy, and I accepted the job just to get my foot in the door. It was another secretarial position in the family medicine residency program, but I felt free from the pressures and demands of my former employer. I didn't realize how toxic that environment was. That was really my first adult experience working full time. So I loved my new job at Beaumont, and once again, I worked hard. I took on more tasks that I thought were important, but others would have left undone. There were so many things that people just didn't do, and so I just took it upon myself to get it done. I worked long hours. And I, I can't believe this, but I, sometimes I would work as late as 10 o'clock at night, but I would still finish, found time to finish my bachelor's degree. One of my other early positions was as director of patient registration, and registration is the front door to the hospital. I mean, that's where patients um, come in to be registered, so it's every department is your customer, physicians, um, other leaders in the hospital. But back then, automation was pretty limited, and there were no apps, there were no phone apps, there was very little interfaces, and I had met a vendor who needed a beta site for a, um, it was a patient wait time monitor, and I won't go into all the details, but essentially what this did was it, it paged us any time we had more patients waiting more than 10 minutes. <clears throat> so this, um, so we implemented this, and when I started getting paged, and my, my team started getting paged, it was... I was really surprised. The reason I was surprised because I, I thought the reason um, patients were getting backed up was because we weren't adequately staffed. And we were adequately staffed. What was happening was that we didn't have all members of the team on the same page. Some people weren't where they were supposed to be. See, I'd had other leaders telling me that their patients were being delayed by registration, and I didn't believe them. I didn't listen. I got very defensive. And I thought they were picking on my department because I'll blame registration, and, uh, but that really wasn't the case. That experience, what they taught me in hindsight was that I needed to listen more, I needed to talk less, and realize that people don't usually complain without reason. And now healthcare is so focused on patient satisfaction and focused on the customer that it is, their perception is their reality. 
and it's important that we as healthcare professionals focus on that. So it was a very good lesson for me and um, I carry that with me. I'm not perfect and I, I know I still have issues, we all do, but I really always try to strive to make sure that I listen. In the early 2000s, I became a hospital administrator at Beaumont Troy, and um, I accepted, in 2006, I accepted an opportunity to go to Beaumont Royal Oak as an administrator. So six weeks into my job, I was told by the hospital director, or as the hospital president is the term now, that I had to cut over $2 million out of my budget. $2 million is still a lot of money. Back then, you know, it was a lot of money. So I panicked because I really didn't know what to do. I, nobody even really knew me yet. So we had some consultants come in from one of the national firms, and I'm sure you've all had experience with consultants. And they make sometimes some pretty outrageous recommendations that, of course, you have no buy-in from your team or your staff. And um, so in this case, everyone told me the consultants were crazy, including the department director. So I had to figure out for myself how to get some of this done. So one of the recommendations was to reduce the number of techs we had working on the MRI machines. And um, so I said, I'm going to spend a couple days. I'm just going to watch this whole process. So I learned that we had a cancellation rate of about 25% for inpatients that were waiting to come down on the MRI machine. And it added more than a day to their life to stay. So after a few weeks of meetings and working with the management engineer, I convinced the leaders to make a number of changes that included staggering the, the schedule so we could eliminate the number of people on the machines. And um, we also increased the amount of time. Uh, we went to a 24-hour schedule. There were a lot of things that we did. And we also had one of the uh, supervisors in the department start rounding on inpatients on the inpatient unit because one of the reasons for the cancellation was that they weren't prepped properly. So they did the questionnaire and they made sure that the patient, they screened them for all their metals and worked with nursing, found out any unusual things with the patient. And that cancellation rate essentially went down to zero. What we were able to do was we were able to decrease in almost an entire day's length of stay because for patients who had um, radiology exams, and I, we did this for a couple of different areas, and that's where the savings was. We saved more than a million dollars. I hit my goal very easily by doing those couple of things. The other thing that we had done <clears throat> was we developed the first productivity standards for the radiologists. Again, I spent some time trying to understand, working with a man management engineer, gathering information, analyzing it. And it's funny because uh, Juliet and I have had this conversation already about uh, she's very analytical, so I see her brain working all the time when we're talking about I do, I see it. <laughs> <laughs> she asks a question about something very analytical. Um, but we found um, that there was a lot of variation. We had radiologists, some reading as few as 60 films a month to some reading a thousand. And I'd been asked uh, by the chief of the department to add five more radiologists, and that just wasn't going to happen, especially when we were trying to cut costs. So what we were able to do was we blinded all this information, presented it to the physicians, we set new minimums and maximums on what they could read, because some were actually reading too many studies a month. And we avo avoided um, all of those radiologists, and what we were also able to do was set a turnaround time of less than 24 hours for all reads for radiology, and that again improved patient flow. There was a lot of more work to be done, but I was only there for two years when the opportunity um, at uh, Gross Point was presented to me. And I have to tell you, that has been, at this point, the toughest part of my career. It was about nine years ago, and Beaumont had purchased the former Bon Secours Hospital in Gross Point. And I accepted the position as Vice President of Operations as a part of a new administrative team hired to turn the hospital around. Several of my colleagues tried to convince me not to leave Royal Oak, and they said, what are you thinking? Why would you go to a hospital that's losing $18 million a year? And that really was all I needed to hear, because I thrive on challenge, and I'm one of those people that, if I'm watching a football game, I always root for the underdog, because I'm <laughs> And, um, but if somebody tells me it can't be done, it pushes me even harder, and if I believe in what I'm doing, I don't give up. So Gross Point, Beaumont Gross Point was in rough shape, both the facility as well as financially. 
But what we found was the most dedicated group of people that you'd ever want to work with. And to be honest, all the folks there didn't even know if they'd have a job after the merger. I mean, looking back, how would you get rid of everybody and rehire people in? But um, anyway, it wasn't even it wasn't even a question that that would be a, a, a task. <clears throat> what I didn't realize then was the real risk. And because most failing hospitals do not recover, especially in a competitive market that Beaumont Gross Point was in with St. John Hospital down the street. So the new hospital president, um, he put his administrative team in place. I was a part of that team. And we started from scratch, and we had to refresh the entire facility. We had to actually hire more nurses. We had to improve quality and patient satisfaction. We had to create new programs, develop trust with the physicians, the employees, and our volunteers. One of the other things I didn't realize that was most important was because we were right in the middle of a neighborhood in Gross Point, was that we had to develop a relationship with our neighbors. We couldn't do anything right. We made noise, you know, lights, all kinds of things. We often tease, and they still tease, about writing a book titled, You Can't Make This Stuff Up. <laughs> As each disaster was a new chapter, we had floods, we had power failures, we had broken sewer pipes. I mean, <coughs> after it was all said and done, it really is a beautiful facility. <clears throat> and we turned a profit in three years, three years earlier than what was projected, and the quality and the customer service is really exceptional. So again, what I didn't realize was that how important Gross Point was to help me prepare for the opportunity as the hospital president at Beaumont Trenton. So let me switch gears, and I just want to share with you a couple of things that um, often young people will come up to me, or people that are developing their careers, and, their, and they ask me questions. So I thought I'd share a few of those thoughts with you that I get asked often. So sometimes I've, I've been asked if I have a mentor. And what I re didn't realize in, until it was too late was that I had a mentor and I didn't know it. So my brother-in-law, Don Elan, was a professor at Macomb Community College. And he was part of the reason that I ended up going to Macomb when I started taking classes. And he took a lot of interest in my education. I saw him and my sister quite a bit. My sister and I are still very close. And, he always asked about my classes and how I was doing. And as an educator, he had great insight uh, in terms of problems I had or if I shared an experience, but he never told me what to do. He just offered ideas. And looking back now, I didn't realize how much he was there to guide me. And he passed away nine years ago. And it wasn't until, actually, I started thinking about today that I realized how important he was in, in helping me and guide me. So now someone who I consider myself as in the fall of my career, I've been a part of mentoring uh, a number of young people over the past several years. And what's been hardest for me was not to give people the answers. I mean, it's so easy for me to say, just do this and just do that. and and. Um, but it, what's important when you're working with somebody as a mentee was to provide guidance to help them figure out how to find their own answers. And there's a, there's a method and a way that you, you can do that. Uh, but it takes a little bit more time, but at the end, you'll find people that can be more independent and think more on their own. So sometimes I've been asked, what do I look for in a leader? And it's important for me to see and hear that people have fire in the belly. And I use that term because I want to see people with perseverance who are committed to healing the patient. And I believe leaders need to have clear goals and objectives and at the end of the day can tell you what they're focused on and what they've accomplished. And it's important to me that I see compassion in a leader who puts their employees and their patients first. <clears throat> I like to see people who can demonstrate to me they're a team player and can develop and maintain good working relationships to others, similar to that example I gave you earlier. I want to work with leaders who are critical thinkers, a team that's not afraid to challenge the norm. I mean, it's easy to shut people down by forcing the answer you want to hear, and I've tried to remind myself not to do that. But sometimes I know it can be difficult, but otherwise you lose the opportunity to assure your team it's okay to think. And otherwise you get vanilla, and you lose the opportunity to be great. 
So young women often ask me about work-life balance. How did you do it? And we were just talking about this over breakfast, about Natasha's twins and her three-year-old. It was the great stories. And the answer that I, I say now is similar to some of you who've worked through this, and, and it's just, it's okay to say no. At some point back in our careers, we, I think, at least for me, I didn't think I could say no when there was an after work event or I had to, you know, work long hours all the time. But if you want to be a leader, you know you have to work some long hours. You have to go to some after work events. And if you decide to have children, you know, don't miss the concert. Don't miss parent teacher night. You make the rules that work for you and your family. Times have changed and I applaud the young people who figured this out already. And I'm very proud to be the mother of two grown children they're wonderful kids, and now they're on their own. And I think being a mother has always been so important to me. And I may have been late a few times to some of the things I'm talking about, but um, I loved every minute of it. I also have a great husband who's been very supportive, and he did actually more of it than his share of the heavy lifting with the kids, I have to tell you. <clears throat> so the other thing young people early in their careers ask me about is how you how do you in your career and how did you get the experience for the next position? And again, if you've been heard my theme already, I think you can guess pretty simply, you work hard. And you look to see where there's a need for something to get done. And then as appropriate, you make it happen. I shared examples with you on how to take on more responsibility, but also to be curious. And when you question something isn't right, challenge that. I believe if you consider this approach to whatever you choose to do, you'll always find a new challenge. And if it's chairing a committee or a task force or, or adding some organization to something that's needed, your efforts are going to get noticed. So when I started my career, women were mainly restricted to more traditional roles within healthcare. There were very few female physicians, directors, or administrators, and most female leaders were in nursing. And quite frankly, it was our nurses who opened the doors for many of the other female leaders in healthcare. And I don't think they got a lot of credit for making that happen. So for your, for your nurses in the room, I just want to say thank you. As I, has been mentioned in articles, that women oftentimes are overlooked in meetings. And their ideas they share are credited to men. And no offense to the men in the office, uh, or here in the office, in this room. Um, but it's been uh, noted in a lot of articles that ideas are credited to men who might have repeated the idea, and then they receive the credit, and then it happens. It happens all the time. Men can be assertive and rewarded, but women who are assertive can be cast as the B word. And it's just been in the recent past that this issue's really surfaced, and now more research has been done, articles published, and companies are adapting new strategies on how to deal with it. So it wasn't until the latter part of my career that women have really started to network in their own organizations and realize there's power in networking and power in numbers. And all that being said, until about four years ago, there really was a glass ceiling at Beaumont with only one woman invited to be at the table with the most senior of executives and within the system and one woman president at the hospital level. So many female executives felt their voices weren't being heard, and women were told they needed to speak up more and share their ideas, but many didn't feel comfortable because they felt their ideas were dismissed. Others said they were speaking up, but they weren't getting noticed. So this group of women from around the organization created a women's network as a forum to help develop strategies and not only to be heard, but to also find ways to help develop female talent within the organization. And I'm gonna share with you a couple of the things that we did and uh, continue to, to use these strategies to help women find their voice. And really, this can apply to anyone. It can be young men. It can be people who are more introverted, who uh, really don't feel comfortable uh, speaking up. So for example, I had to learn how to read the room. And if you notice a woman, or again a man for that matter, waiting for a chance to speak and they're not being acknowledged, interrupt for them and say, let's hear what Chris has to say. She's been waiting for an opportunity to talk. Another example is if you're chairing a meeting, look for body language that might direct you to ask somebody to share their thoughts. You know, you can tell they're twitching and they want to say something, but they're kind of, you know, a little introverted. So, you know, pull, every, pull everyone's input into the meeting and not just those that always talk all the time. Yet another example 
and this is one that I actually pulled from an article, that after a woman has made her point, repeat it and give her credit to avoid someone else from taking credit. And this actually, this technique was developed by the female staffers at the White House after being dismissed one too many times. And it denied uh, men the chance to claim an idea for their own. Apparently the president was doing this himself. And he acknowledged it and started to call on women more often in their meetings. I just want to add um, that my 24-year-old daughter and I were talking the other day, and she, she works in the marketing depart department of a prominent loan company in Detroit, one of the largest in the company or in the country. And we were talking about our jobs and our experiences that day, and she we, she was talking to me about Hurricane Matthew, and she was being asked to develop a piece about how to prepare the homeowners for the hurricane. And she said they had a lot of dialogue and everybody was talking about how to prepare people. And she said, so what I said was, I told them, I think it's more important that we be there to help them deal with the issues they'll face after the hurricane, not as much before. Now that's what I'm talking about. I, it's a new generation and they're not as afraid to challenge the norm. I think things really are changing for young people in particular. And I'm happy to say there's six of eight hospital presidents within Beaumont Health who are now women and our COO, our chief nursing officer, and chief legal officer, and the president of the foundation are all women. I can tell you it's changed, and it's changed a lot in a very short period of time. And it's also my pleasure to have the opportunity with a group of very strong leaders that are here today from the hospital. And I'm honored to see that we have a full table, so that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm getting to know everyone a lot better, and hopefully vice versa. And um, we've created a number of ways that we can communicate. Uh, we've created a, weekly, a bi weekly operations meeting so we can share ideas. And we've also started a 15 minute daily operations meeting where we can all talk about issues from the previous day or the, the current day, and we can share information and find out things that are going on around the hospital. And it's really helping me learn a lot about the hospital, uh, but hopefully it's allowing them to get to know me as well. We're creating our first strategic plan to help us guide us for the next several years, so we're really just getting started. So in closing, when I think about my mother's life as a homemaker, started around 70 years ago, she was starting her family and how limited her choices were, and then we skip forward to my life experiences and how times have changed exponentially for not just women, but for all of us. And finally, I skip back, skip a bit further to the future to think about what a great time it is now for young <coughs> women and young men. And like my daughter in the workforce and how her generation may be the first to truly experience equality in all fronts. Regardless, I'm happy to tell you that my team will tell you that no one gets my lunch at the office. In fact, I usually brown bag it. But when I think back to 40 years ago, I realize how things have changed and I trust and pray that while it won't be perfect, our sons and our daughters will never have to face the same challenges. And thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts today. I've, I've really enjoyed it, so thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Chris before we let her go? I have a question okay. for you. Um, you said you had two children. What kind of daycare did you use? Did you have family or did you find a daycare center? We actually um, had a family friend who had um, used an in-home daycare, licensed daycare, and she was an absolutely wonderful woman and just was, actually she had done some early childhood development. Uh, but, you know, that was tough, you know, getting to work early and one of us dropping off, one of us picking up, and so we actually had the same person for the whole time, I think uh, seven years from my first to my, my second that they were in daycare, and then they went into after school programs, so. But my husband's self-employed, so he, once the kids were um, a little bit older and getting out of school, he would be home for them at 3.30 every day so that he could get them off the bus and, and be there until I got home, so it worked out really well. That's why I said he did a lot. <laughs> so, anybody else? Other questions? Yes. I was just going to ask, um, not only are you a leader within the hospital, but um, I'm sure you're asked to do community outreach programs or nonprofit. How do you pick what you spend your time with? I, I think you have to pick whatever your passion is um, when it comes to um, 
And in Girls Point, I got involved with seniors, best citizens, older yeah. citizens for SAC. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, services for older citizens. And um, I've had an affinity toward uh, the elderly, and I'm getting there myself. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, no, seriously, I they did great work, and they really helped keep patients or um, elderly people independent uh, much longer than they would otherwise. And I think it actually also helped me as I started dealing with issues with my own mother and my father who passed away a year ago who also had dementia in a nursing home and we've just done the full gamut. So I think you have to really uh, follow your heart and what you really believe in. The other thing I'll tell you is don't get involved in ten organizations. You know, pick one, pick two. But don't get overly involved because then your life is crazy and um, that just couldn't work for me with the demands I had at work. So, Other questions? One last quick one. Yeah, Betty. Um, you've talked about that it's okay to say no, but with your work and the demands of being a hospital president, how do you take care of yourself? I mean, what do you do to rejuvenate yourself so that you can tackle these challenges every day? Well, it's interesting you say that because <laughs> since I took this job on, I haven't been able, I, I like to go to the gym, I like to exercise, I, I'm an avid golfer, I love to golf, I like to walk, so um, during the summer I've been able to do a little bit of walking, but um, I'm going to be moving into the community, I'm going to be moving it to Woodhaven, we, we got a condo there, and I hope is to get back and do a little bit more exercise, but I do think you have to take care of yourself. And exercise does create good endorphins and, and you know, it helps us all feel better. You know, I've been battling a, a bad cold this week, but um, that's why. <laughs> yeah, that's why. You're probably right. Uh, but anyway, uh, you do have to take care of yourself. It's very important. So, thank you. Yes? With your insight in the medical field and, and dealing with an elderly parent, what were your criteria for choosing a nursing home? Well, uh, Beaumont has an affiliation with five uh, nursing homes that, that they are part owners or joint venture, and I was familiar with the way the nursing homes were run. I've worked with the medical director, uh, Dr. Imam, uh, who oversees all the nursing homes, and so there was a nursing home close that was central to all of us. There's six kids in my family. so. Um, we chose one of those nursing homes just because we, I knew what it was about. Um, I had all my siblings go there and say, because you know, everybody has an opinion. So they also went there and um, checked things out, and they're very well run. But there are, there are resources out there, Area for Aging and the different counties has a lot of good information uh, for uh, aging parents and uh, things that, you know, just different resources available to people. It's an amazing. Um, agency. So they also have lists of nursing homes available to you to check out, you know, prices as well as how they're run. So she's had wonderful care, just absolutely wonderful care. I can't say enough good things for her care. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, well thank you very much. Well thank you. <laughs>